All right, so um, I'll just go over like a quick summary of what he said. Maybe you weren't here last week. Maybe you were serving upstairs in children's ministry. Could be a lot of reasons that you wouldn't have caught the whole thing of what he was saying, but it's hard to summarize it because he talked for an hour and he goes fast. But like if I had to bottom line it, I'd say we all would agree that in order for revival to happen, we need more power in our lives, right? A a, a mediocre, lukewarm church is not going to be ready when revival comes. Revival comes is going to require a lot of diaper changing, right? There's going to be a lot of new babies that need to be fed and changed and, and nurtured. And, and God has done it forever. He's done it through revivals, but we have to be ready. And if there's things in our lives that are, that are not keeping us from, he, from heaven, right? Do you remember when he said that? These, these spiritual transactions that happen don't keep you out of heaven, but they can make your life hell on earth, was the way he said it. So how many agree we need a more powerful army of Christians? A little louder, please. All right, yes, we do. And each one of us can only do what we can do. So the thing is just to hold up a mirror to ourselves and say, okay, Lord, show me where I can improve. There's got to be areas in my life where I can still go from wherever I am to a greater level of engagement with you. So that's the first thing. God needs an army with power. And then he said our actions constitute spiritual transactions, both godly and ungodly. And he talked a lot. He gave a lot of scriptures about godly blessings that come, right? You all know that. You sow the wind, and then you reap the whirlwind. So if you sow blessing, you reap higher levels of blessing. But if you sow ungodly spiritual transactions, or he called them demonic spiritual transactions, then you sow the whirlwind of bad problems that come your way, right? So everything we do is a transaction. It's either godly or ungodly. That was a great point he made. And then he talked about how in in the epistle of Peter, he said that our adversary, the devil, roams about like a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour. Remember? And what was that word for adversary? You could read it up there if you want to cheat. If I did it, did I do it right? Yeah, it's up there. Attorney. He's a prosecuting attorney. It's the same word. Your adversary is looking for evidence to use against you. And one of the hardest things for Christians to grasp is that something that my forefathers did could be impacting me today because it doesn't seem fair. Remember how often he said that? But a spiritual blessing, we don't seem to have any problem understanding how my forefathers' blessing can pass down through the line. But we have a hard time believing how the negative stuff can pass down to us today and be impacting us. But it's got to work both ways, right? If the blessing comes down, then so can the curses come down. And it doesn't seem fair in that if they sinned, why am I having to pay for that? And it's just because when the devil got Adam and Eve to sin in the garden, it opened us up to a war. And these are the rules of engagement, whether you like it or not. These are the rules of engagement. So he made that point that if you keep seeing recurring patterns in your life, and he used the example of when you go to a doctor, why do they ask you about your family medical history? Because there might be a predisposition to a certain kind of problem. So that was our third point there. We have an attorney who's bringing charges against us, and those ungodly transactions from our forefathers are testifying against us, and that's what he called inherited battles. So maybe there's addiction that's been trying to hound you, and then you realize, wow, when I look back at my family line, many people in my family line have suffered from addictions as well. Or it could be a racial thing. Sickle cell anemia seems to impact African Americans more than others. Right, So there's something about our makeups that can cause us to be susceptible to certain things. But now you're a child of God. So you have new DNA in you, but you have to remove those old ungodly transactions. And the only way, you know, the point that he kept pressing was get on your knees and ask the Lord to show you what those things are. Because if you're not asking because you just don't realize it could be impacting you, there's a whole treasure of information that could be available that you're not accessing. You have not, the Bible says, because... See, count me as one of those hot ones. (laughs) I'm going to be spitting all over you pretty soon. All right. So that's what he said. These are inherited battles caused by demonic spiritual transactions of our forefathers. I love the example he gave. He says, they testify against us, and they hold us back like a dog on a leash. 
He can get so far, and then boom, you get yanked back. You get so far, you're not making progress, and you just got to, he said the fasting and praying won't release you from the transaction, but it'll reveal to you what the transaction is as you press in. So that's why we started out on that first one with the picture on it. It said, dig deep. <laughs> I'm just quoting scripture. It's right out of Luke. It says, dig deep. I'll read it again. Whoever comes to me, hears my sayings and does them, I'll show you who he's like. He's like a man building a house who dug deep. That's how you get to the rock. A lot of us grew up in lives where we were building on top of the sand of the culture. What the, what the world said was acceptable things to do. You could cheat on your taxes. If, if you get, uh, get in a car accident, you can go to an auto body shop and get them to give you an inflated, uh, what do they call it? estimate, and then you submit that to the insurance company. You know what? The insurance companies are ripping you off anyway, so it's time to get back at them. Right. Or, the, or the clerk at the checkout counter makes some mistakes and gives you too much change. You could just pocket that because, hey, how many times have I been ripped off? And that's a not transaction. Right. See, you got to be walking by faith and say, no, give her back the money, man, right. because there's something checking on us all the time to see what we really believe. And we do what we believe. And many times we don't even realize until we get deep enough in the word that so many of our decisions are based on sand, not the rock, based on the culture, or it could even be the way your family did things. If you're old enough to remember Archie Bunker, he's a good example. Because if you grew up in a home where all you ever heard was racist comments all the time, then how could it not possibly affect you? you're going to be thinking that that's how the rest of the world operates when it's not. But that seemed normal to you. So now it's like, Lord, make this be normal to me. You come into my personality. I don't want to take on the traits of the world. I want to sow into my spirit, man, not into my flesh, man. And Archie Bunker, look, you know, we could pick on him. The guy was a brilliant actor. And the reason it was funny, quote, unquote, is because it was true and that we make a lot of really bad assumptions about whole people groups that are, that are so dishonoring to God when we do that because he sees all of us as being pricelessly valuable to him. And as soon as you put a label on somebody because of a color of their skin or any kind of, you know, they don't have enough education or whatever you think is the grid, that's not God's grid for value. So then a lot of these transactions that were done by our ancestors, you can't go back and change them, but you can repent of them. And you could say, Lord, I don't want to be impacted by the prior generation's negative, demonic, ungodly spiritual transactions. And you break it. You break it off your life, right? And that's why the last point I made there was says, freedom comes by digging. And ask the Lord to reveal the root, and then what? And then repent. And then this wonderful part, renounce. So if it's Archie, we can all kind of relate to Archie. Lord, I renounce the racism that was in my family line that's trying to pass its way down to me. And it might not even be evident. Maybe nobody's ever told you, hey, you know, you, maybe you don't realize how you're coming across, but sometimes you come across as, as a little judgmental. Maybe it's not even being told to you, but if there's a root system of Archie Bunker in there, then it's likely it's somewhere in your system. How hard is it to just say, Lord, I repent of that, I renounce it as an ungodly transaction, and I break that demonic hold off of my bloodline, and, I, and I'm going to walk cleansed from that and go forward, and now I'm going to make a new decree, which I just love. We had so much good preaching in the last few weeks. Jane Hammond especially was the one that talked a lot about the decree. You can go back through those, both of those, like three hours of just Jane speaking. And this one, a lot of us know it from Jeremiah 1, but it's one of those um, the rules of engagement is that your mouth makes a huge difference, right? Death and life are where? In the power of your tongue. We're going to focus on the life part now and talk about proactively decreeing things that need to shift the atmosphere around you. And if we really believed it, we would have a big guard on our mouth and we would watch what, what comes out because we realize that every negative thing we say is also a transaction. And it's being tallied in the heavens. So I'm going to speak life with my mouth. He put his life in me. I really believe some of us would agree with what I'm about to say. You would be dead if the Lord hadn't saved you right now. Look at all the hands going up. I mean, it, look, it's wild how we forget that sometimes. So if he's saying, be careful what you say, 
There's a whole spiritual law in effect with what you say with your mouth. Be careful. Speak life. And this is it, Jeremiah. The Lord, Jeremiah 1, so he was talking about as, a, as an infant, right? Then the Lord put forth his hand and touched my mouth. And the Lord said to me, behold, I have put my words in your mouth. How many of you could say that about yourself? He did. He's put his words in your mouth. And you could see it throughout the Bible. Moses said, when I open my mouth, Lord, you fill it. You fill my mouth. Because he had no confidence in his public speaking ability. I will fill it. You open your mouth, I will fill it, the Lord said. Oh, but my 10 is key. See, I have this day set you over the nations, set you over the kingdoms to root out and pull down, to destroy and throw down, and to build and to plant. That's some marching orders, isn't it? That's some marching orders. Over what? That's what it says. Set you over the nations, over the kingdoms. How about over your family line? Yes. That's part of your kingdom is over your family line. You can be that diamond that's set in your family. You might be one of the only Christians in your family. doesn't matter. They're all blessed because you're there, because you're praying for them, and you're not judging them, and you're acting in a way that's still loving, even though you have Archie. I mean, that's like trying to hug Archie Bunker is like trying to hug a porcupine. But you can do it. See, natural you can't do it, but God's love in you can still see God inside Archie Bunker. And even though you feel very defiled by the things coming out of his mouth, you realize that there's a, a pumping station inside of him and it's poisoned. But if you can get to that poison and remove it, now all of a sudden life starts coming out of his mouth. And, and that's true for all of us. It doesn't just have to be racism or, or those kind of defiling comments. There's many ways that we can be defiled. But God said, root it out and pull it down. How do you do this? You have to ask the Lord. You go into prayer. Maybe you could do this Tuesday night since we're not going to be meeting here. But you go into prayer in your prayer closet. And you say, okay, you know, I wasn't aware of these kinds of rules of engagement. But what's some of the fruit? What's some of the evidence that I can see in my family line that may be holding me back from fully engaging in what you want me to do? And then just wait and see what he shows you and journal and take notes. And it's amazing what he will show you. But it's not just root out and pull down. It's also destroy and throw down. So that's where the renouncing comes in. And you acknowledge it as a sin. Again, if it was Archie, Lord, I repent for the racism in my family line that defiled your creation, that judged people as people groups when you hold everybody equally valuable. Everybody equally valuable. I repent of that sin and I renounce it as sin. And don't want it in my life. I don't want it being in my pump. I don't want it coming out of my heart and my mouth. I want to speak life and not that poison. But then the last one is to build and to plant. So that's the new resurrected side. You have to crucify that old Archie Bunker in you. And then you come out resurrected side. And that's where you build and you plant. And that's who he wants us to be. Now the nice thing about the Lord is that there's always one more project that he can work on with us. <laughs> it's a lifetime uh, membership <laughs> like you don't ever reach a point where everything's been done no. right because if I if you nailed me to a cross I'm not sure I would be able to say the prince of this world is coming and he has nothing in me <laughs> way down there there might still be something that's still working or me say father forgive them for they know not what they do it would be more like Lord bring lightning and take them out and introduce nuclear power right now <laughs> and take out my enemies. The apostles even said that, Lord, please, can't we just call down lightning? Please, can't we call it down? Because it's biblical. Elijah did it. Can't we do it? And he's like, you don't know the spirit that you're of. I didn't come to destroy life. I came to give life. So we come to, plant, to build and to plant. And look, it might not be some big, huge revelation, we had a chance to spend time with Carrie and Anton, and they gave us some of the backstory of what he was referring to, that he had run into a real obstacle in the business world, and the Lord revealed it to him in two different dreams. And then he also has a very prophetic wife, as you saw firsthand, and that's a nice combination too, isn't it? Because she was seeing things, and she spoke into it, and it had to do with a curse on the land that they were involved in, but they wouldn't have known it until they prayed into it. Once they prayed into it and broke it, all of a sudden, that resistance was gone. 
And a lot of Christians just feel like this is way too much work and it's spooky and it's weird. But look, we read the book and this is what the book says, okay? And, and I, I don't want to be held back from anything that the Lord wants me to have. I want that abundance that he wants me to have and not just accept it and say, this is my lot in life. And that was another great expression. Uh, he said that we um, decorate the pit. <laughs> right, we just accept the fact that I'm, you know, Joseph, I'm in prison, so I might as well make my jail cell look better. No, I'm getting out of this jail cell. I am not staying here. <laughs> All right, and this is, this is the one Jane Hammond was focused on because... Well, because what? She's a powerful teacher. Let me just tell you, she's a general in the army. Really blows people up who think women should not be preaching. Well, but so does my wife, by the way. So does so many people. But uh, she just really focused a lot on Esther and declaring and making decrees. And this is when there had been such a battle, right? Remember, Haman wanted to take out the Jews. And there was a plot, and he built the gallows that he wanted to hang Mordecai. And all of a sudden, the roles reversed. And Esther was the queen. So she had the king's ear. But she still had to take a big risk, didn't she? So this is verse 7 in chapter 8 of Esther. It says, King Ahasuerus said to Queen Esther and Mordecai the Jew, Indeed, I have given Esther the house of Haman. <laughs> all right, so there you go. Romans 8, God makes all things work together for good. To those that love the Lord and are called according to his purpose. This guy, Haman, wanted to take Mordecai out. Boom, reversed. He's now dead. And God gave through this king, gave Esther that guy's house. How great is that? All right, but there was still more work that needed to be done. Esther, the house of Haman. And they hanged him on the gallows because he tried to lay his hand on the Jews. So now what does he say in verse 8? To Mordecai and Esther, you yourselves write a decree. She made this point 10 different times, Jane Hammond, over the time she was here. You yourself, Mordecai and Esther, you write the decree. I'm the king, but I'm delegating it to you. Don't wait for me to write it. You write the new decree, and I will give you my ring, and that will seal it. How many of you have written decrees? Let's keep doing it. When you find this new thing, whatever the clue is that the Lord gives you about Archie Bunker and your family line or whoever it is, renounce that thing, repent of it, renounce it, and then declare the new thing that you believe for. You write the decree, the king said, and I will give you the seal. That's the rest of this. You yourselves write a decree concerning the Jews as you please in the king's name. Who's our king? Jesus' name. You do it in Jesus' name and seal it with the king's signet ring. Jesus is sealing what you pronounce for whatever is written in the king's name and sealed with the king's signet ring. No one can revoke. <laughs> Here comes the problem, though, because there's always a problem in there. <laughs> because if we start getting too puffed up and we got too much of Saul operating in our spirit and not enough Holy Spirit in our spirit, then we can take the authority in our arrogance and we can start putting a Saulish tilt on the gift of God. We don't want that to happen, do we? So this is just a quick minute clip that she makes a really good point that I wanted um, you to hear. Years ago, Prophet Bill and my husband, before we started deliverance teams here, they went up to this deliverance ministry up in Detroit, Michigan. And they would put each of them in, like how long was the session? Like a three or four hour deliverance session. And where they would have this team of people that were like in your face, casting out devils for like three or four hours. Very confrontational deliverance. And when they went to this deliverance ministry, that's not how we do it here, but that's how they did it there. And when they, before they went, they had to read through all the information about, you know, what they were, the ministry that was going to go there. And then they had to sign it. And this is what it said. It, it said, in the middle of ministry, don't tell us how to minister to you. If you could have set yourself free, then you wouldn't be here today. It's so funny, but it's so true, right? So sometimes what we need to know is that we need other people. Actually, we need other people a lot. <laughs> now, yeah. it's no excuse for us not to individually be disciples. We have to be disciples ourselves. We've got to deal with our stuff. But if you're dealing with stuff and you're not getting free of it, it's probably because maybe you need somebody else to help you in your life. That's it. I told you it was short. So what am I warning you about? 
is that as the Lord starts to reveal things to us, we tend to then say, yeah, okay, now, now I know what I need. So when I go in for prayer, I'll tell them what I need. And the prayer ministers aren't really asking you. They might be asking you questions, but it's not so much to tell us how you think we should get rid of this thing. Because the reason they're prayer ministers is because the Lord has used them for many years to get to the root of the problem. And the very thing we want, which is to get whole, we can get in the way. Because we're telling them how to do their job. And that's so blunt, the way the guy wrote it in that paper, right, was, listen, don't tell us how to minister to you, because if you could have got free on your own, you wouldn't need to be here. <laughs> got it? So, like, humble yourself. Under the mighty hand of God, we don't always have to know all the answers, do we? But our culture told us that. The culture told us we do need to know all the answers. And, and that's a hard thing about being humble, but we serve a humble king. So if he modeled it for us, then we should be able to strip away our understanding. I was telling somebody another uh, example where this lady who's a professional psychologist was doing a study on shame. And that's a deep study. And she wanted to write a book about it, but then she realized she was dealing with shame. <laughs> so she said, all right, I'll go to counsel. And she walks into the counselor and says, okay, you've got six weeks. And I don't want you talking about any of my family history stuff. You got six weeks. Fix me. <laughs> like that's a total recipe for disaster right there. It's exactly what that lady just said, Jane Hammond just said. If you could have got free on your own, you wouldn't need to be here. So you don't dictate to us how we do this. It might take 60 weeks. It might take two weeks. We might be done today. Who knows? Point is you have to humble yourself. This is what my main point I'm trying to make is you don't have to dictate the terms of your healing. Just make yourself available to the Lord and the vessels that he has around you that, that are amazing vessels that want to speak into your life. And why drag it out longer than you have to with all your stuff? Just cooperate with the Lord and watch, watch him bring freedom. All right, so that's the reason I'm bringing up Philippians 2. I mean, there's a lot of verses that we could memorize in the Bible, but I would really argue this is one of the ones you should focus on to, to put it in your spirit because it's just it's something about this little poem in, in Philippians 2. That's what many scholars believe it was a poem that Paul brought into this letter to the Philippians that carries an anointing on it for our lives today. You see if you agree. It says, Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ, to being in the form of God, did not regard his equality with God as something to be exploited. That's a worth waiting on right there for a minute, right? Because if you read it in the King James and you were growing up, anybody else, you were given a King James Bible and told that that's the only Bible, it's the only real version, it's what they read in heaven. That's what we were told. And, you know, this particular verse in King James to me was very hard to understand because it said, Jesus, who thought it not robbery to be equal with God. And I just couldn't get the connection between robbery. It just wasn't clicking for me. I'm not in the 1500s and working for King James. Maybe 1600s. I don't know when it was written, but it's not today's language. So there's plenty of great scholars out there that give you other ways of reading the same original language. And this is the one that clicks for me the most. It says, he didn't regard his equality with God as something to be exploited. So you could say, I'm above that. If you thought your equality with God put you above a certain situation. But his whole point about serving was, next part, he made himself of no reputation. <laughs> Taking the form of a bondservant, coming in the likeness of men, and being found in appearance as a man, he what? Humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even the death of the cross, which means crucifixion. How does that apply to us? is that as God reveals things in our past that we didn't realize were impacting us, we have to bring them to the cross. We have to humble ourselves. It's really hard to do this because for you to admit that my father, mine wasn't, but just as, a, as an example, my father was Archie Bunker. It's hard to admit. Or my father was an alcoholic. Or, you know, we, we know as Christians we're supposed to honor our mother and father, and that's built into us genetically to want to honor them and want to believe that we came from good, healthy family situations, but didn't, didn't always happen. But what, your fault? 
You were just put in a certain situation. So you have to be honest enough and humble enough to say, yeah, that's really true. He did have racism or he, whatever that dysfunction was. And then you say, and I'm going to take that part of my family line and I'm bringing it to the cross. I'm humbling myself. I'm not going to say I'm going to pull rank. I'm seated in heavenly places with God. And that's what he said. He didn't consider being a f- equal. He didn't regard his equality with God as something to be exploited. When he came into the earth, he fully identified with our humanity without sin. So that when he went to the cross, anything in our family line was covered by his substitutionary work. But you have to be humble enough to say, yes, it's true, and I'm going to bring it up there, and it's got to die. We're not going to fix it. We're going to kill it. Because we know resurrection comes on the other side of crucifixion. (laughs) He became obedient to the point of death, even the death of the cross. Therefore, God has highly what? Now, in the last verse, we read that he humbled himself. And now we're seeing that God exalted him. That sounds like a principle in the word. Humble yourself under the mighty hand of God, and he will lift you up. He will exalt you. You humble yourself, God exalts you. You would think, why does that get in the way? Why does my pride get in the way of me getting healing? Because it's hard to be honest with ourselves. The truth hurts. And you also get all kinds of other things get stirred up. When when God starts to reveal things about your past that you haven't thought about in a long time, you start to get angry at people. And you have to be careful. You have to gauge that, right? It's not wrong to be angry about them, but you have to forgive them. Because you have to also believe that they did the best they could do. And that might seem pathetic to you. Like, you're kidding me. That was the best you could do? And it's like, yeah, but you don't know what they went through. Right? You remember Jack Frost? When, well, I don't know if anybody remember him being here. Anybody? Remember? When, yeah, quite a few were here. But like, he had a really tough childhood growing up. But then he found out what his father went through. And it was brutal. So look, all of a sudden you realize, who am I to get all puffed up? Like, I would have ended up the same way. Can't change that. But I can look at it through God's lens and say, yep, I'm going to start by believing they did the best they could. Even though that seems impossible to me, I don't know what their life was like, and I can't change it anyway. But I can change today. Therefore, God will highly exalt you. That's, I'm going to say it right here in Philippians 2.9. You humble yourself, he exalts you. You say, you know what? I don't really care about my reputation. I'm not trying to become famous. I want to get healthy. <laughs> I want to be emotionally healthy. I want to be spiritually healthy. I want obstacles removed out of my pathway. And if it means I have to admit that my father was Archie Bunker, so be it. I had no control over that, but I'm not going to replicate that negative, demonic, spiritual transaction. I'm severing it and breaking it. All right, looks like you're tracking. That's good. Now, this is so cool. He didn't seek a reputation. That's what it says in Philippians 2 in that first part. He sought no reputation. But now it says that God, after he exalted him, has given him the name which is above every other name. So when you don't seek the reputation, God gives you one. That's the real one that you want. Not the one that the world would say is important. Oh, I've been with Christians that have been embarrassed to say to a a crowd of secular people that they were Christians. And it's this cultural pressure. Like, wouldn't want them to think that. Well, okay, the Lord said, if you deny me, I have to deny you. So let's just be all in. God will give you your reputation when you surrender it to him. You humble yourself. He exalts you. It's so awesome. That at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow. And every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Now, don't you think there's a little bit of a contrast with this picture? Because it says every knee will bow to Jesus. But now here's Jesus bowing his knee to Peter. Talk about humbling yourself if you're God. Talk about thinking you have equality with God, but it's not something that you should exploit. You're not pulling rank on somebody else. Well, that's below my dignity. Here's God coming to the planet. And washing the feet of somebody who's going to deny him and saying, that's not below my dignity because I'm identifying with your humanity. And, you know, the devil later, he says, the devil's going to sift you out, but I have prayed for you that you'll return. Take care of my sheep. Everything that you learn through the trials that you're going through, you take care of my sheep. Do you love me, Peter? 
<laughs> take care of my flock. Take care of my sheep. Love the people. Because you've been humbled, now you humble yourself. Isn't that awesome? That Jesus, the highest reputation, every knee will bow to him, and yet here we see him bowing to Peter, a sinner. And in one of the commentaries that I read on this, I loved it, because not everybody realizes that that quote, every knee will bow, every tongue will confess, is an Old Testament quote. Isaiah 45, 23 this is how this author wrote it. To me and me alone, says Yahweh, every knee shall bow and every tongue shall swear. Do you know that was in there? Yeah. yeah. So there's a lot of those in the New Testament where we're being quoted in Old Testament scripture. And now all of a sudden you realize, wow, Paul was referencing something back to them. The readers knew it because they were Jews and they knew the Old Testament. So what does it mean? Pretty profound that God is saying, to me and me alone, every knee will bow. And yet we now find out to, to Jesus, every knee will bow. God is making Jesus equal, showing you that that's part of the Godhead. That if every knee was going to bow to me, the Father says, you now bow to my son, you're bowing to me. You've seen me, Jesus said, you've seen. So is he trustworthy? If there's somebody here that hasn't trusted him as your Lord and Savior, we're all here to tell you he's trustworthy. You can put all the chips on the table and go all in with Jesus. You will not be disappointed. He has been tested for 2,000 years. Still the King of Kings, the Lord of Lords, still the one with all the answers to everything you ever need. And no matter what the culture tries to do to normalize the sin, he still stands as a beacon shining out. Follow me. All you that are heavy laden, I will give you rest. Follow me, and you got the right path to follow. I'm sweating, man. I'll tell you, it's good. Sweat for Jesus. Just don't come near me after the service. There'll be a, a shield around about me. <laughs> All right, so I'm going to take it down the home stretch because you need some practical things here too, right? It's not supposed to be spooky and weird. It's supposed to be, you know, we're made in the image of God. So we're starting from a base of being made in his image. Sin tilted us, right? You will not surely die, the devil said to Adam and Eve in the garden. And they didn't die when they ate the fruit, but they did bring death into the garden. So we're struggling against something God never wanted us to have. He didn't want death. He wanted us to have life eternal. And when he comes back, we are going to have life eternal. So the very same thing, that beautiful garden that Adam and Eve had, we have when he comes back. That's a really good thing to remember, to maintain your hope. So what should we do? We have two choices. According to Paul in Galatians 6 here, he says, don't be deceived. God is not mocked. Whatever a man sows, all of your transactions, good and bad, whatever a man sows, that he will also reap. For he who sows to his what? His flesh will of the flesh reap corruption. But he who sows to the Spirit will of the Spirit reap everlasting life. There's your two transactions. There's your godly and ungodly. I want life, then I execute godly transactions. I learn what the Word says. I don't just read it, I study it. I show myself approved as somebody who knows the Word so that when some counterfeit argument comes along, I can recognize it right away. No, no, that truth doesn't line up with the Word of God, and this is my ultimate truth. But when, when we're not educated in the word, we can be fooled very easily. So nobody can do that for you. So, but here's a different angle. I can either sow to my flesh or I can sow to my spirit. So you have that little handout that I gave you in your bulletin. Everybody get a bulletin today and get that little handout. All right. So there should be a one pager in there that, uh, that you were given. You could share it if you're with somebody and you didn't get one. But this is easy. You can, you can pull this down right off of the web. It's, it's free and easy. It's a good place to start. And what does it say at the top? Who am I? And then I have a choice. On the left side, it says I could be an orphan. Or on the right side, it says I could be a child of God. Which do you want to be? I want to be a child of God. So as we're thinking about where we should start digging, one of the things you can look at is what are some of the symptoms of my life? How am I behaving? Am I behaving like a child of God or am I behaving like an orphan? 
And this is not meant to defile anybody here who's an orphan. Could be somebody here who's an orphan, right? That in itself is not a condition. If you're saved, you're a child of God. That's it. But then there's areas in our lives where we're not modeling what it would really be like to be a child of God. We're modeling what it's like to have an orphan spirit. And we don't want to have that orphan spirit because guess who the chief orphan is? Satan. He got kicked out. He thought he could exalt himself above the Lord. He was one of the archangels in heaven and was evicted because of his pride. So look, you're not an orphan. You're a child of God. If somebody says, who are you? Don't say, I'm an accountant. <laughs> an accountant is what you do. <laughs> it's not who you are, <laughs> right? Who are you? I'm a son of the living God. I'm a daughter of the living God. That's the best answer you can give. Well, but you seem to have so many flaws in your life. I know, it's amazing, and he still loves me anyway. <laughs> That's not what an orphan would say. That's what a child says. Look, man, John F. Kennedy, when he was president, his son was little, and he would have important dignitaries in his office. But if his son ran in and jumped up on his lap, boom. Didn't matter who was there. This is my son. This is my son. Big difference of being an orphan and thinking you have to earn it. I won't bother you with all the different levels there. But the way I gave it to you is in a way that you can actually just you know, pray over it and spend some time with the Lord. And look at each one of those questions. Because the band in the middle is the behavior. Above is the orphan action. Below the band is what a child would do. Each one of those bands is a different action. So you can write in the box. You could say, boy, I'm sure tilting towards orphan on this one. Or no, God give me great insight on that one. How do I get my identity? By what I do or by knowing who I am? An orphan would say by what I do because that's the only way I can get a reputation. It's interesting that I had that vision during worship today of hands digging in dirt and finding a box and seeing a, a new birth certificate with the right name on it. And the title is Digging. <laughs> Oh, Lauren and Nello had a birth certificate with her today. See, I love that. That's so cool, isn't it? A new, a new identity. I just love it. See, that's how God works. See? So now look, here's how you can look at this sheet that I gave you. You could say, am I sowing to my flesh or am I sowing to the spirit? And these are difficult questions to ask. It's like, really? Can't I just go get root canal right now? Like, why do I have to do this? Because the truth hurts, right? And nobody really wants to deal with it, but it hurts more to live in a lie. So, man, there's all these great sayings. One of them, the pain of discipline is better than the pain of regret. Because <laughs> you don't want to live the next 10 years of your life avoiding stuff. Get to the root. Start living an abundant life now. Even if it requires a little pain, no pain, no gain. Even the world knows that. So, yeah, okay, it might hurt a little bit. I'm acting like an orphan in this area. But look, there's a lot of questions, right? You can just look at each one of them and say, where am I coming in? Where am I, where am I falling on the line here? More like an orphan or more like a child? A little bit of both? No, really extreme one way or the other. Boy, the Lord will show you. He's really good at that when you ask. So um, here's something that the Sanfords wrote in their book on generational curses. This is from a chapter in their book called Transforming the Inner Man. And this is something you could apply in a general sense. He says, we look for recurrent patterns both of blessing and of harm. Sometimes divorce runs rampant. One man came from ministry who was the result of his mother's third of five marriages. His mother was one of 12 children. His father was one of 12. Among all those relatives, not one had been married only once. <laughs> Anybody doing the math right now? So 12 children on the mother's side all got married all 12 got divorced more than once. 12 children on the father's side all got married, all got divorced more than once. What's the family reunion looking like? Can't keep track of it all. Step this, step that, step this. Look, and again, I'm not meaning to, to try to defile anybody here because many people in the room are in a situation like that. And, and in the marriage counseling I've done for really like 35 years, I've been pastor here for 20, but even prior, we were involved in marriage counseling. And you, help, you try to help the bride and groom 
especially if they're younger people, to anticipate some of the things that they're going to go through. And over the last several years, so many more of the people that I'm counseling with have multiple families and stepfathers and stepmothers. And, and you know, we really have to talk through a lot of those things because, again, I'm not meaning to get off on that tangent, but whose wedding is it? The two people getting married. And just because there might be drama because people haven't seen each other in a while and they weren't nice to each other the last time they saw each other doesn't mean it's going to ruin your wedding, right? Because God's in charge of this thing. Now, we have to respect everybody, but you can really pray hard, and we've seen this happen. You pray hard into it, and, and amazingly, everybody gets along at the wedding because there's, there's a, a call to dignity on the heart of a person to say, I love my child, even though we didn't always see eye to eye, and I'm not going to ruin their day by just some petty spat that I had with my former husband or my former wife. You see how, how it can work? But when you see it as a target, now you have something that you can pray against in advance. Okay, so among all those relatives, not one had been married only once. Think there's a pattern? <laughs> think there might be a susceptibility here to thinking that's the only thing that's normal. You don't consciously think of it, then you get married, and your only thing of normal is, well, we're going to have to get divorced because everybody else I knew in my family, they all got divorced. No, that's not normal. This is normal. You make a covenant with that person till death do us part and not because Trisha killed me. <laughs> Here's another quote from them, and I'm almost done. It says, whenever men will let Jesus reap the dire effects of law through forgiveness and atonement of the cross, the thing gets revealed and now you have to bring it to the cross. And I forgive, Lord, really hard. Okay, Practically speaking, there's going to be anger coming up inside. Why me? How come you couldn't have been better? Why did you favor my brother or my sister? There's so many ways this can play itself out. No, I'm not going to be prideful. I'm not going to tell the Lord how to fix me. If I could have got fixed on my own, I wouldn't need to be in this deliverance session, remember? So whatever you say, Lord, I'm just going to humbly accept it. And just forgive and not hold them up to ridicule and not wish them badly because that's a tool of the enemy, isn't it? God can prevent tragedy if you're willing to do that forgiveness, it says. But whenever men will not repent and by that fail to give God access to the situation, then they have to reap generation to generation. Whatever is sown, however unfair that might seem to the newer children, the unborn, and however much our loving God doesn't want that to happen, there's a law in operation of sowing and reaping, and it's got to be broken. Amen. I already went over that chart. All right, so these are the last two portions of Scripture because obviously if I gave you something about an orphan and a child of God, I think there's a key there. And of all the years that we've been doing this ministry, that theme continually pops up, that we don't really know our identity in Christ as a son and daughter of the living God. We do partially, but in the areas where we have the problems, many times it's because we don't know that we really are loved. The world doesn't say that we're loved unconditionally, does it? The world says, I'll love you at 110 pounds, ladies, but I'll love you more at 105. <laughs> That's conditional love. We've ministered to people who said, if I gain five pounds, my husband will divorce me. And we're like, get him in here. <laughs> <laughs> well, you're not pulling your half of the marriage. Well, it's not half and half. It's 100, 100. <laughs> 60, 40, 50, 50. No, I got to give you my 100. You're supposed to give me your 100. Hmm, not so easy, is it? We have a different interpretation on that 100, don't we? But you got to... Sow into that spouse. Sow into their life. Give them life so they can give you their best 100. So anyway, it's back to identity. Long teaching. I won't do it all now, but here's a little capsule of what it looks like. Luke 15. From a long distance away, his father saw him coming, dressed as a beggar. And great compassion swelled up in the father's heart for his son, who was returning home. Let me tell you, when you fill out this form, you get victory in one of those boxes, this is what it looks like. 
You're finally coming back. You, you've lost the orphan identity, and you're finally coming back. Because before, when you were an orphan, you thought, if I run home, he's ready to whack me. He can't wait to punch me in the face. But now that I know I'm not an orphan and that I'm a son, he's waiting for me with his arms open. He's been watching for me to come back. Dressed as a beggar as I was, great compassion swelled the heart of the father for his son was returning home. So the father raced out to meet him, swept him up in his arms, hugged him dearly, and kissed him over and over again with tender love. What would that look like in your life to be embraced by the Father when you've been walking with shame over things that you fall short on, over ways people have shamed you and constantly reminded you of that false identity, you're never going to make it, you're a loser, you're stupid, whatever they, they've labeled you with, break it off, Sam. It's breaking off. It's not, not yours. It never was yours because God has an identity for you and feel him wrapping his loving arms around you. That's how it works. He swept him up in his arms and hugged him dearly and kissed him over and over. Then the son said, Father, I was wrong. I sinned against you. I could never be deserved to call your son. And even in this passion version, the father interrupts him. The son's about to say, I shouldn't even be considered as a servant in your house. And the father interrupts him and says, Son, you're home now. <laughs> Do I feel like I'm home with God? Because if you're a child of God, that's how it'll feel, like I'm home. I'm safe. I don't have to earn living here in this house because I'm a child. That cannot be separated. My sonship cannot be broken. If I think I'm just adopted and that can be canceled, then I'm always living with that fear and that worry. Quick, bring me the best robe, my very own robe, the father said to his servants and I will place it on his shoulders. Do you ever wonder about like, why they put the bars on your shoulders in the military? Because <laughs> it's a sign of authority. So he didn't say, bring me any old robe. He said, bring me the best robe. I want to clothe him. I want people to know when they look at him that he's my son. And that's how it should be for us. And so much of it is on our side to grasp and understand our role as sons and daughters of a living God, not the orphan outcast earning my way. Well, if I just do this right, if I just do that right, then maybe he'll love me. Just throw me some crumbs under the table. No, no, you have a seat at the table. Look at somebody next to you and say, you have a seat at the table. Even if your name is Mephibosheth. Then what does he say? Bring the ring, the seal of sonship. Woo! The seal. Remember we read that in Esther. The seal. It's one thing if you get free by a servant, but who the son sets free, you are free indeed. There's no question of authority because the son has the father's ring. That's why who the son sets free, no debate about it, no prosecuting attorney can overturn that ruling. Jesus put his ring on you. That's the seal of the king. Bring the ring, the seal of sonship, and I, the father, will put it on his finger and bring out the best shoes you can find for my son. Come on, ladies, you like that part. I know you do. <laughs> the best shoes. Oh, Jimmy Choo, who? Get free from that spirit. <laughs> See, any time that we're putting our hope in a thing instead of the Father, we are taking so much less than what he wants us to have. Man, isn't it cool to know that you are his favorite? Look at somebody and say, you are his favorite. How could that be true? It's true for every single person in this place. Because God is impossible to understand. Every one of us is his favorite. It's not a competition. It's so cool. We all get the robe and the ring and the shoes. We all get a seat at the table. We all are written into the will of the Father. Lose the orphan mindset. Amen.
again, you can't, I can't do this for you. We can try to help you, but you've got to be willing to do some of the tough work. And, and look, there's going to be a mechanism that tries to kick in and say, flee. But it's fight or flight. Don't flee. Face this thing. If not now, when? Like, when's going to be a better time? No, you just give the devil more time to cause you to drift away. No, jump into this thing. Let's stand for this last part. I love this. This is the hottest I've ever been on this altar, I can tell you that. <laughs> it's the anointing. I thought it was the air conditioning. <laughs> Woo! This is like the Shroud of Turin now. <laughs> Now he's comparing himself to Jesus. No, I'm not. This is hot. Wow. Whew. So I'm back. I'm not in the pigsty. I lost my garments of orphan. Dressed not like a beggar anymore. I got my father's robe on. He put his ring on my finger. I've got his shoes. And now what does he do? It says, let's prepare a great feast and celebrate. Let's prepare a great feast and celebrate. So, I don't know, maybe I could just encourage you to relax a little bit here, right? And if there's a striving in you that you think you need to please God, he's throwing a feast for you as a son and daughter. And some of you are worried that there's a dish missing, there's a fork missing, something over here. No, no, you are the guest of honor. You don't have to do anything. It's on your behalf. He's throwing the feast for you. Martha, get a little more like Mary and just sit at his feet. Amen? Now, nothing wrong with serving and doing all those things are great, but only right perspective. Because some of us are so busy, we can't even receive the love that the Father wants to give us, right? And just recognize, he's doing this for me. Let's prepare a great feast and celebrate. For this beloved son of mine was acting like an orphan. But he's my son. This son of mine was once dead, but now he's alive again. Come on, let's lift our hand. I'm alive again. I'm alive again in the Father. I am not an orphan. I accept my role as son and daughter of the living God. I am not what I do. I am who I am in Christ. Son and daughter of a living God. So Lord, I just ask you to give us that new birth certificate today that I saw in the spirit as we dig down and we look on some of the layers that have built up in our lives. And this isn't like terminal illness kind of stuff, but it's holding us back on the things that will help us move forward. So as you show us, Lord, just make it real clear who our identity is, that we're your children today. We're loved. We're, we're the beloved in you. We're your children that could come in the room even when you're busy and sit on your lap and you don't throw us off and throw us down to the floor. We cancel that counterfeit identity now in Jesus' name. Just speak that over yourself. I cancel the counterfeit identity the devil tried to put on me that tried to come down through my family line. I cancel it. I renounce it. I repent of it. And I decree life over my identity that I am not an orphan, but I am a son and daughter of a living God. His spirit's alive in me. And I will fulfill the destiny that my heavenly Father has for me. In Jesus' name. Everybody said, yes. Amen. So, the last question would be, anybody want to be invited to the feast right here? Right now? Anybody want to get rid of those orphan clothes? I mean, just so dramatic. He said, dressed as a beggar. You know, you might have walked in here as a beggar. You don't have to leave here as a beggar. It's a decision that you make. It's a mindset that you shift. You say, I'm not going back to thinking like I'm in prison anymore. He opened up the jail door. But I can't stay sitting in the jail. The door's open. You don't always want to walk out because I got, what do they call it? Three hots and a cot. You ever talk to somebody who's been in jail and say, well, at least I get three hots and a cot. Three hot meals and a place to sleep. Man, God has such a better place for you than three hots and a car. He wants you in his family. If you don't know him as Lord and Savior, this is your chance. Just walk up to the altar and say, I'm losing my identity as an orphan, and I'm accepting my identity as a son or daughter in Christ. Amen? Come on, church, let's pray. Heavenly Father, I come to you in Jesus' name. 
I recognize there's sin in my life and that I can't save myself, but that what you did for me on the cross and then through the resurrection has purchased my salvation. You took the punishment that I deserved and you opened the door to my jail cell. I make a decision today to walk out of the jail cell and to sit at the table of celebration of my father's house. I accept my position as your son or your daughter today. I take you, Jesus, as my personal Lord and Savior. I'm not going to turn away, I'm not going back to that old sinful life, but keeping my eyes fixed on you, Jesus, the author and finisher of my faith. I accept you as my Lord and Savior. Fill me with your power so that I can serve you for the rest of my life and for eternity. In Jesus' name, amen. Act like you're at a party. Keep bringing out the best wine. He saves the best wine for last. That's the kind of party Jesus throws, amen. So anybody here say that prayer? Didn't know the Lord when you came in, but want to make a commitment to Christ? The best decision you could ever make? Amen. Double down on that. Double down on that. Yeah, well, I was going there. Yeah. Because some of you might have walked in as, you know, in the beggar clothes and, and feeling like an orphan just in one area. There's no shame. In fact, coming up to the altar might be one of the best things you could do to show the devil, I'm rubbing it in your face, devil. You're not keeping me as a beggar and an orphan anymore. Come up to the altar. Step out of your seat. Just come up to the altar and say, God is greater than the orphan spirit in my life. You don't have to be embarrassed about it. There's no shame in this. Could have been a cultural thing. You know what? Culture's fine. There's nothing wrong with our family line, but this is the better culture. Amen? Amen. All right. So we always have prayer at the altar here, every service. That's no different today. So those of you that are going to be on the prayer ministry team, come on up. We are having it today. So you come on up. Those of you that need prayer for any reason, come. We just thank you, our guests, for being here today. We honor you for your role that you've played to help build God's kingdom. And I know I could sense that you're still building it today. So thank you for coming. We honor you for being here today with us. Those of you that need prayer, come on up. The rest of you, I just want to speak a blessing over you, okay? So Lord, I thank you for the Father's blessing that comes from heaven. I thank you that as you extend your scepter towards us, just like Esther, you extended the scepter and we are welcome in your home. So we step out of the jail cell today through that open door that you gave us and we sit down at the seat of the, of the dinner that you are holding on our behalf and we celebrate with you the king today. I bless your people as they go this week, Lord, that they would walk in victory in everything they face this week in Jesus' name. Everybody said amen.